Thank you, Gerhardt, and welcome to our witnesses, and especially to yourself, Mr. Reid, your first appearance before us in your new role. Can I just start with you first? I, I listened to what you said um, over the course of the last hour, responding to the other members. And if I paraphrase what you're saying in terms of spending, whether it's current or capital spend, uh, you get an envelope or a pot of money, as in the HSE, and that money then has to be managed. You or I may have a view on the size of the pot, but the pot is the pot, and uh, you need to manage that, which is what we call for. So we call for you to do your job and to make sure that money is managed, and taxpayers' money is managed. I have no difficulty with that. The problem is this. There was a letter sent to each hospital manager, and indeed I think each hospital group by yourself, where you outline your concerns about historic overspend and that you are taking a hands-on approach to making sure that each hospital comes in on budget. Um, I think you asked them to identify uh, whether or not there was a, a potential for an overspend and if there was to put in place and you didn't make, use those words, but hospital managers have used those words in terms of their responses to it, cost containment plans to make sure they come in on budget, and they will then be overseen by hospital groups. And also, if hospital managers don't come in on budget, then they'll be held responsible for that. So that was what I took from, from the letter that I saw, and paraphrasing from what you said earlier. So would that be a fair assessment, first, of your position? Thank you, Deputy. I, I feel the need to just state uh, one of the reasons I wanted this job is because it's probably one of the best public service jobs in terms of meeting the needs of the public. Uh, and there's no greater need than the patients that we serve and the people who use our services. So my commitment to this job is to make it better for those people. That's why I'm here. Uh, in terms of the process that we set out with the managers, and I have met all of the managers, and we are continuously meeting monthly for the rest of the year. Uh, and I have to put on the record the engagement and support I've got on them to date has been uh, well received. Uh, in terms of the issues that you just said, in terms of the process for them, you know, it's not cost containment, it's delivering the services that's committed in our plan, making sure we deliver them across all the, all the service strands. Uh, and delivering to the budget that we have. Now, I'm, I'm absolutely aware... Okay, just stop you there, so mm. If it's not cost containment, is it your position then that if a hospital or a hospital manager believes I have to spend more than I've been given because I have to make sure we meet whatever demand is there, because I can give examples which I will in Waterford at the moment, they're not obliged then to come in on budget, they're not obliged to publish what I was given and by hospital managers in Waterford, and clearly a draft of a document which talks about cost containment. So is it your view then that cost con containment isn't a priority for hospital managers, that they don't have to put these plans in place? No, no manager in any hospital and anywhere in the public service has a mandate to just spend based on demand. We, we just don't have that. And they, fairness to the hospital... No, I know that. What I'm saying is that if they're looking at cost containment plans on foot of a letter that they got from yourself and you said that there isn't any cost containment plans. In Wardford, for example, that cost containment plan, and that's what it's called, looks at limiting surgical theatre space over a number of months during the summer, uh, cleaning contracts, looking at where savings can be made there, agency spend, overtime, there's a whole range of other areas, all designed to make sure to come in on budget under a heading cost containment. So what I'm saying is that there is an element of cost containment, which is essentially, as I put you at the start of my contribution, you making sure that they come in on budget. Um, you might want to call it cost containment, that's what they call it. But is that what is that what is happening in hospitals across the state? Well, I think what's happening in hospitals all across the state, they're all under huge pressure in terms of the demands that's on them. But the process that I'm engaged in with them on is looking at the budget that they have to deliver all those services. Uh, in the case of Waterford, they've been doing a number of things just in relation to best utilisation of their resources, particularly during the summer period. Uh, and that, all, that also involves the theatre uh, usage and best use of resources during that period. So they're doing a number of operational issues that make sense for Waterford. I'm not setting out the plan for each individual hospital or each group. Uh, they're working that through themselves in terms of their overall budget. Did you know that some cancer patients were sent home because of theatre capacity? Uh, five patients who, and I'm sure you're aware of, you're booked in for 
surgical theatre for uh, some sort of cancer treatment. It's life altering, so there's a psychological impact, building yourself up for it physically and mentally, and you go to the hospital and you are ready to get to surgery, and then you're told you have to go home. And hospital management said it was purely down to capacity in terms of surgical theatre space. And yet over the next number of weeks and months, that cost containment plan will kick in where there will be a reduction in surgical theatre. So that's the, that's the outworking of it. Mm. Were you aware of that, first of all, that patients were sent I'm not, home? I'm not specifically aware of that, that matter, uh, okay. and I'm happy to... If you well, want what to I'll it. do is I might just talk you through, because the, the best lens that we have is our local lens, our local hospital, when we're looking at, at what's happening. Because I have no problem whatsoever with you making sure that the HSE and health spending is contained. I mean, that's, what we, that's one of your core functions, and, and it should be. So I have no problem with, with that, and I certainly accept that you've come into this job to make sure that you play your part in making sure that patients get the best health care. Again, I have no difficulty with that. But I put a parliamentary question in to look at what are the wait times, outpatient wait times across all specialties over five years, to get a sense of where the pressure points are in the hospital in Waterford, and then to see are we putting the solutions in place to reduce the wait times. And in fact, where all the pressure points are, the wait times have gone up. So examples, dermatology. Almost 5,000 patients waiting to see a consultant. 1,576 up to two years, from one to two years, and 665 from two to three years. Orthopaedics, which has been a problem for a long number of uh, years, 1,267 between one and two years, 959 between two and three years. And ENT, which is a major problem, 2,805 between one and two years, and 1,500 between two and three years. Uh, urology is a problem, dermatology is a problem, and they've been consistently a problem for the last five, six years. So I meet with, as one of my functions as an Oireachtas member, with local Oireachtas members, we meet on a regular basis with the hospital group, hospital managers, and we have a good relationship with them. But they point out to us, here's the pressure points. And uh, unless their budgets are increased, or unless their capacity is increased, whatever about budgets, whatever, unless the capacity is increased in these areas, the wait times are not going to go down. And my concern is, and, it is, and my question is, given that you have wrote to all hospital managers to say, make sure you come in on budget, essentially, <coughs> is there flexibility within that if there is extra funding needed in any of these areas to, to reduce wait times where there is obvious pressures, where if people are waiting two to three years or three to four years in big numbers, is there, is there flexibility on your behalf then to, and others to say, well, actually, yeah, that's fair, fair enough, and you, we can't commit the extra resources? Uh, Deputy, just to touch briefly on a couple of comments that you just made and specifically answer your question. Um, you, and, you, know, you mentioned there's been extra, there has been extra budget for the past five or six years and the situation hasn't got much better in terms of waiting times. I mean, that's factory, and I don't disagree with you. Uh, so the waiting times issues are a real issue for me. Uh, it's a real issue for me in terms of priority uh, working with the system. So, but putting extra funds and money at it hasn't actually addressed it. So I think that's a challenge for all of us, and, and you've been involved in Slanchi Care, I know, the whole Rockless. But that's a challenge for us, all of us now to look at. If it's putting extra money in, and it hasn't worked for the past five or six years, we have to do something differently. And I'm committed to that. I want us to look at the health system and where we fund it and how we address the service needs of the people we're serving in a much better and different way. And Sláinte Care does set a roadmap for that. But we have to start utilising our budgets in a different way. Mr Reid, where the money goes. So I would always look at things very logically. And when you look at the way times... For Waterford, and you can look at every hospital is different because they have different needs, different, it's different geography, it's, it's, there's different capacity, and the hospitals um, have their centres of excellence or they, their, their, their level of expertise in, is in different specialties. So it's, 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 they, they all have their unique characteristics. But one thing you can logically do is look at where the pressure points are over the course of a number of years and say, well, here's the problem and then there has to be a solution. And there is in some of these cases, which brings me to the capital plan, and I think you had discussions on that earlier as well with Chuck to O'Brien. Um, there is a number of business cases to solve some of the problems here that have been made by the hospital group to go to the hospital management. And 
what I'm trying to explore here is how all of that works from conception to completion when a business case is made, because Mr Breslin and I would have had some discussion and your predecessor in the past in relation to a second catalogue, for example, in Waterford, a new mortuary. The mortuary, I think, was in, in, in the capital schedule for almost since 2013. Only this year was it freed up and the money was made available. So sometimes the hospitals do their job, the groups do their job, they identify the business cases, they go up to the HSE and then we have to wait for years and in the meantime the wait times go up. So I talked about ophthalmology, there is a business case for a new eye clinic in Waterford. I talked about orthopaedics, there is a business case for a new centre of excellence for orthopaedics which will involve, I think, moving some of the services from Kilcreen and Kilkenny into Waterford. There is a business case and Chop O'Brien talked about cancer care earlier. I think there's only, is there, in six of the eight hospitals, there's robotic technologies that can be more precise in terms of surgeries and cut wait times and deliver better outcomes. Waterford isn't one of them. It's a cancer centre. It doesn't have the robotic technology. The consultants have looked first. They've developed business cases. So my question is, how does that work? And that's the frustrating part for us. That's, that's where we come under pressure as public representatives, where business cases are developed, there's a need there, and it goes through a really long, complicated process, sometimes taking years in the case of the mortuary before it's actually delivered. So can you talk me through, from conception to delivery, how that works in capital funding? Thanks, Deputy. Just, I did want to come back to the question you did pose last time. I, I didn't. Apologies. Um, you asked me the question just around is there a mandate for managers and hospital groups and, and clinicians, etc., uh, in terms of if they see a need to, to spend extra funds for particular demands to go ahead and do it? Uh, obviously, the answer is no, just in terms of we work in the budget. But I think the monthly process that we're putting in place, where we're working very closely with all of the hospital managers, groups, etc., and community, that we will be able to predict where we have extra demands, where we may be able to find some capacity. And I think that's good practice, that we may be able to reallocate some funds for particular items. And I think that will be, I think it'll be welcomed uh, when we're talking closely. The second issue to you, which you just spoke around, the, um, the pressure points in the system and where people have some good ideas. Uh, and I've been in Mortford, um, yeah, University Hospital, I've been in Galway, I've been in Mullingar, I've been in a lot of them, Kilkenny. Uh, and I have seen some really good ideas and some good innovation at a local level. There's some very good innovation, uh, and indeed in Beaumont, uh, some very good innovation around emergency departments, some very good innovation between interactions between the CUTES and the community organisation, uh, some very good innovation and engagement between GPs and the emergency departments. So there's actually a really lot of good local initiatives that are going. So for me, it's not really about waiting for a big... Uh, buying initiative from Solange Care, we need to do these bottom-up initiatives and support them. Uh, that's happening. So I just want to yeah. say to your point. Specifically, and I accept that, but specifically my question was around capital projects and the perception that they can take a lifetime from conception to delivery, almost like turning a big tanker around before uh, people see that there's actually delivery. And we put down parliamentary questions and it's in queue, there's a business case or it's at this stage or whatever stage and people get very frustrated because they are the ideas you've just spoken about. And I know it's all in, in base, obviously it's dependent on funding as well. What, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand is what is the process? Why does it take so long at, at times for to, to, to get from uh, an idea to actually being delivered? So. Is the first step a business case, and then if if he if they don't have the time to set it out here, maybe a note to this committee on what the stages are in terms of a capital applications. We better understand it. There's a business case developed, obviously by hospital management in conjunction with the group that goes up. I would imagine the HSE. There's all the other layers. HSE estates have their role to play as well, obviously. So that can be a frustrating process when there's a good idea. So maybe if you could give us a note on what that process is, and is it an area that you've looked at to shorten that process and um, to make it more efficient uh, so that these, as you acknowledge, good ideas can be delivered quicker? Did 